welcome everybody and we hope this one hour will be very fruitful uh, so what we're putting on the table here very interesting topic which is about um, the management of older core blood units and again where there will be um, various definitions from various perspective how do we define older core blood units and how we have like few questions to answer, such as the definition of older core blood, uh, older units, actually, um, from uh, various perspectives. Uh, what problems do they present, and how might they be managed? Um, the, uh, we can start with this question. It's not necessarily by age, uh, old units, or something as the name may entail or uh, may may give the impression that it is an old unit maybe it's uh, it's uh, all processing technique or all type preservation technique that have been used during a certain period of time long time ago and which is uh, no longer being used or something i'm just like a, 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 like placing at the table some elements that may be considered uh, attributed to old core blood units um, uh, to link it to the technology back then, where, uh, say, for example, HLA typing was not done at the molecular level, uh, was done, say, by serologic methods. And uh, we all know the complexities of those uh, units, like a bank and the registries, we have them available in registries, etc. And how can we mitigate this? How can we make them uh, viable again? Uh, th this kind of thing, uh, th that's the purpose, like why it is we're considering them as old core blood unit. Basically, as we all know, core blood units shouldn't age as if they are um, theoretically, um, they are still alive. And we do um, say, for instance, every bank will do uh, a stability program to ensure that they are still viable whenever they started to do the cryopreservation preservation for those core blood units. So uh, this is just like a little introduction about what we can consider. If somebody else would like, excuse me, to add more um, elements that can contribute to label those old, uh, those core blood units as old, um, other than the technology that was uh, done in the past, for instance, the bags versus cryovials, as we all know, the, the early days, we started to do cryopreservation using cryovials uh, before we moved on to the bags, et cetera, et cetera. And again, the HLA based on serology, I'm repeating this, uh, rather than uh, molecular and also um, there will be many other criteria and such as uh, the processing technique, was it red cell reduction? Uh, was the process validated? Was uh, just like random, like kind of a research. And we move from the research to actual uh, uh, conventional treatment for certain diseases using the core blood units. So I would love to hear from you about the first question and we can add more elements about it. And please feel free to introduce yourself and to bring more ideas to our table. I can jump in first if you want. Um, I'm Heidi Mwazen. I'm the director of stem cells at Canadian Blood Services. So I oversee the public cord blood bank in Canada outside of Quebec. Um, so it's interesting because I think another definition of older, at least from the public sense as well, is when you're dealing with units where the standards have changed, since the time that you bank them. So I think yes. banks need to really understand or have an approach for what you're going to do now if you have a new standard, a fact standard or an AABB standard that's now in place that wasn't in place when you bank this unit. So do you, if you have a segment, do you do that test? Obviously we're limited with the number of segments, so maybe we wouldn't do that test. Does it have to go out as exceptional distribution then because it's not meeting the standards of that current time? So I think that's another thing uh, for consideration. Thank you, Heidi. That's an excellent point actually that you brought it. Uh, especially back then there was no uh, segments. Sometimes they only have the cryovials, right? So it's uh, we, we try to balance here like between, okay, are we going to 
uh, exhaust all the stem cells bank towards testing, or we're gonna give them for potential uh, benefit or transplant for the transplantation. How much are we going to spend or sacrifice those stem cells for testing? But of course, we need to do the HLA testing. That's no uh, question asked. But I, again, uh, this one of the limitation that you mentioned, and this is extremely important. Thank you very much. Anybody else has any other uh, perspective on it, like um, that we can learn from? Yeah, hello there. Uh, this is Manu Leonorici. I'm the executive director of business affairs at the National Corbett Program in, in New York. Um, and I think it would be interesting also to introduce another uh, consideration because uh, the older, older uh, uh, label for a unit may be not as meaningful or important if we look at other potential utilizations of the core blood units, right? So if we look at them strictly from a perspective of uh, 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 transplantation of stem cell, hematoid stem cells, uh, then clearly we're looking at them from a certain perspective. But if in fact, uh, as I think it's happening right now where there is more and more research going on and a variety of organizations, private companies, as well as public banks, looking at core blood, uh, units from the perspective of potential source material for further uh, manufacturing uh, and uh, different products, then maybe this uh, perspective, it doesn't tell the whole story about uh, the value of those units and how to manage those units. So I think we need to be careful in, in deciding, you know, what, what universe we are discussing. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's perfect perspective. Thank you. My name is Amnon Peltz from Israel. Uh, we are the largest private bank in Israel. We see the pipelines of clinical trials going into using cell and gene therapy and option, optimum of using it for CAR-T or for autism and CP. So I believe that uh, those old units, uh, especially autologic one, could be very value uh, when you have young and healthy cells compared to old and sick when the patient will be 15 or 25 or 35. So for us in the private bank, it's a family bank. It's very, very important uh, to keep the standard very, very high. So this is my comment. First of all, cell and gene therapy will bring a lot of you out there. Uh, maybe also for allogenics, so from the public bank as well. And secondly, uh, we have to make sure that we have a regulation much more strict, allow ourselves to be in the market when you have people who doesn't keep regulation strictly. Uh, this is the reputation of our market. And the business of core blood and stem cells have to be state of the art. And therefore, we must push for of regulations and check up and to ethical between the members of uh, the CBA. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you for your feedback about it. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, about the public versus the private banking. And as you know, uh, the related CBBs, corporate banks, um, they have specific requirements set by the fact standard and other accreditation bodies as well. And they have to be in compliance with certain criteria to ensure the safety and the potency and the purity of the cells as well as um, for the public or the banks. Uh, of course, it is like, as uh, I agree with you, it's not as stringent as it is for the public banks. Um, uh, just for a simple example about the contaminated units, um, the corporate bank uh, uh, will discard the unit, the corporate unit. Um, when, when it is in the family bank, for instance, uh, family bank is allowed to bank it and release it under exceptional distribution if other uh, parameters are okay, like in terms of the uh, the potency of the cells, etc. As long as they determine the antibiogram and identify the bacteria, notifying the transfer physician. And again, here is the way 
um, of the risk, assessing the risk between should we give a contaminated unit with commossal flora or something or uh, for a patient who's dying or not giving it at all, especially if that global unit is matching within the sibling in the family. So it's a little bit very sensitive issue um, uh, between the private and the public bank in, in this regard. But I agree with you that the, the requirements for the private and the public should be equivalent, if not like uh, at the same level of safety. Uh, I'm, I'm with you. And uh, it, hopefully this will happen in the future, in the future revision. Uh, currently the uh, second, the, the eighth edition of the Cobra Bank International Standard is uh, being reviewed. Uh, it kickstarted like a couple of weeks ago. So, yeah. Well, thank you very much again, uh, Amron. Thank you. Anybody Hi, this is, else? Uh, is there yeah, any this other? is uh, Matt Wilgo from a New England Core Blood Bank. We're a family uh, core blood bank. Um, the take from a lot of the family banks will be a little bit different. I think most high quality ones are going to be a member of some accrediting agency. You're going to have accreditation by AABB or FACT. You've been following those for for years, you can be relatively assured that there's a, a good quality process in terms of the overall running of the company and the, the protection of the units. Mm -hmm. um, our, our take on older units is a little different. It's a similar to what the Heidi had said uh, earlier um, in the fact that over time, standards and regulations do change from country to country and within the organizations. They tend to improve over time, uh, which means there's usually more data uh, you know, gathered. Some of the oldest units in, in many banks might only have had you know, a, a T and C count. And over time, viability via different methods from Tripan Blue to 7 AAD or more advanced methods have been developed. And we try to keep up to date with all of those, obviously. Um, same thing, yeah, CD34 enumeration is pretty much key. Um, some banks will even do, you know, four requests, um, uh, colony forming unit assays, uh, depending on the needs for a transplant or or clinical trial. And then banks like ours have that capability as well, which is, is nice to see, um, you're just increasing um, it does create challenges sometimes for the outgoing units or requests to see if they're going to be usable because the data for any bank over time is going to change. So again, as we already discussed, ones in vials uh, and ones in, in bags or even multi-chamber bags now uh, may all be different. Um, and there's different methods of freezing them, different methods of checking them. Um, all of those things matter. I think one of the biggest things you see from some of the accrediting agencies is the requirement for a stability program. And that's one of the number one questions we'll get from some of our older clients. Some of our older clients are at this point uh, over 20 years. And I spoke to one last year and he just wanted to know, you know, was his core blood still good? And while we can't directly test that because this was all in vials, and again, it comes down to we could, but you're going to sacrifice some percentage of your cells, which you didn't want to do. I went over the stability program with him and other units that have been donated, clients decided to discard and uh, chose to donate them for our stability program to check now, even though we didn't have the initial sort of uh, tripan blue, or uh, sorry, 7 AAD viability on flow cytometry, we were still able to thaw those units out and still show that our methodologies back in the day, uh, um, over 20 years, had great viability, um, you know, over 80 and 90% in many cases um, for the, the larger units. So again, as long as you've been following the science from, from day one and doing things appropriately, uh, I think there's some guarantees of, of some quality. Again, there can never be guarantee for any individual unit in a public or private bank. You know, diseases and, and dosages are all different. Um, but I think the main consideration is what each bank is doing, public or, or family, uh, to ensure that their inventory is, has some degree of quality. I think that's a, a focus, especially for the older units. Can but, I ask a question? Two questions. First of all, uh, what kind of limit uh, you promise your client today? Do you give them 20 years, 40 years? Uh, what kind of a promise uh, you give your client or they are paying year by year? That's one question. The other question is, what kind of a program is it? Are you checking it like a QA? So you have uh, allogenic uh, donors uh, units that you can check every year or every month? Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are great questions. So in terms of guarantees, we're very clear with our, our clients. Again, being a, a for-profit business, we're offering a, a service. 
um, and we have to be you know, crystal clear with them. Uh, while there's no specific guarantees, we do discuss the, the science, that if things are done appropriate to the, the science following standards, and we follow ABBs, which are, are similar to fact, uh, there's every likelihood that there will be a, a high degree of viability. So we check initial samples and post-process samples. The clients get those results um, and they can discuss those with a medical director. In terms of long-term storage, we cite the most relevant papers out there. And the last one, which is a little older, um, had units that have been tested and published around 20, 22 years. Uh, they've been using units that have been cryopreserved for 13 years uh, and used in transplants. So again, those are all published materials uh, we will reference. Uh, we routinely have a uh, check our, our stability program as well. And I think the oldest unit we've sent out was accepted and successfully used in a transplant uh, had been stored for about 10 years. So we discuss all those things with the clients. All of us here should know that the, the science behind cryopreservation, if done appropriately and maintained appropriately, uh, could be decades or even hundreds of years. Um, in previous positions, I've worked at other biotech companies. I've worked with cells frozen down in the 70s and 80s, thawed them out with 70, 80 percent viability and got great colonies of mammalian cells. Mm -hmm. Obviously, hematopoietic yeah, stem cells may be a bit different, um, but as long as they're being kept at negative 196 or at least well below 150, if you have less stringent uh, controls in place, um, they really should last a long time. And again, monitoring transient warming events, your liquid nitrogen supply, all those things have to be part of a quality system. And I think when we go over that with a client, they feel relatively assured. Uh, but again, catastrophes happen, things can happen that can be outside the control in any individual unit. There can't be ever a specific guarantee. Uh, but speaking of the general science, they're fairly good. For our particular second question, our program is fairly robust um, and we're updating this all the time. So we do have clients who decide to discard some, after some time, 5, 10, 20 years. Some of them have kept for over 20 years. Uh, they do have the option to have them discard, you know, destroyed or to donate to our stability program, which we always is something nice for them to keep pushing the science forward. And a lot of them take advantage of that. Uh, in addition to client samples that are no longer being paid for as a service, uh, if the client chooses to, um, we never test on samples that haven't had a donation consent basically made. Um, we do purchase research units every so often from uh, other institutions, specifically to enter into our stability program to test with every methodology. So again, our stability program has all of the components, vials, bags, et cetera, et cetera, with every methodology we've done in the past. So we try to test all those things over time. It gets a little complicated sometimes, but again, it's worthwhile because if you don't test your methodologies and validate your methodologies, you can't really offer any assurance that what you're doing has any value. And of course, that's bad for a public or private bank. Mm -hmm. So th that's an excellent idea, like about the uh, stability program and the stability studies done on older units, absolutely. Um, uh, during your uh, stability program studies, do you take into consideration the previously, uh, like the data that you have already captured in your program about uh, maybe or may not be the case for the exposure time for chiroprotectant and the warming event, et cetera. So in a manner to say, okay, we have a very good viability, we have very good potency here and uh, that's what happened. Um, the exposure time was X, Y, Z, and the warming event, it was exposed to temperature warmer than minus 150 degrees. Do you just try to link those uh, variable parameters to your end results when you do this? Yeah, for us, um, so I, I'm not entirely sure to answer the question. For us, we have methodologies in place realistically which prevent the, any real transient warming events. We to, to the best of my knowledge, reviewing all the data uh, back for quite some time, um, we haven't had any because we have a lot of safeguards in place. Uh, we have somebody who can get to the facility within about five minutes if we, we go beyond. I think our you know alarms go off at like you know negative 180. So if there's even a a minor movement to the probe, um, but again, um, you can't ever get there. there. There are of course always risks for any of these things. So we have. Uh, things in place to to test um, if there's you know transfer or something of the sort, but realistically speaking, it's not something we've had to deal with. Uh, mm -hmm. So I guess my question is: Is that something that's normally happens with um, you know, public banks or other banks out there that have had transit warming events? It, in that case, we of course would run a battery of tests with whatever stimulate programs are in that particular tank. But in generally speaking, that is probably the uh, 
worst thing that can happen for any place to be completely avoided. So I think that's more uh, prevention than than testing after the fact, I guess. <laughs> I agree with you, especially like when the final product doesn't meet the success criteria. That's what I meant, like uh, to, to go back and to search for the root cause analysis for uh, upstream processing prior to uh, the final product. So yeah. uh, um, thank you very much. That's great. Um, for, the, for the sake of the time, uh, we only have one hour and to respect everybody's time. I think we exhausted the first question. How do you define other units by what uh, the, everyone mentioned about them? So if, we, if you permit me to move on to uh, what problems do they represent at this point? Uh, I would like, I would love to hear from you. What problem do they present those old corporate units at the present time? Uh, Mr. Elias, um, if I, you allow me, I'm Sergio Querol from, from Barcelona Corbot Bank in Spain. I'm representing Thank a, you. Public, Hello. A, public, a public corbot bank from the na uh, Spanish uh, national corbot program. So in my opinion, the concept uh, or the problems of the older common corporate banks are, are, are related. And we take the, our first position is that actually don't exist such, such older corporate, corporate units. What, what we have is actually uh, standards that are moving ahead and somebody have told that. The banks are accredited, not the units. So the units, are, are in two situations. They can be released in a com compliant to a defined uh, uh, requirement or, or they not and could be released under a risk assessment. Obviously for the bank, the most important for the bank is to be as much as quality as possible to minimize that risk. But when we are receiving an accreditation is the bank who received the accreditation, not the unit. So the unit, if you have units that has 20 years old and you can demonstrate because you have been so prospective that you have sufficient reference samples to, to validate that release, your unit is perfectly up to date. Yeah. So like the, sec the second thing, the second mm -hmm. thing is the indication, the use. We are using these units for more marrow transplantation. And for that, there is very well studied what is the relationship between HLA and C34, for instance, or other or another content. So, right. but if we are using this unit as a starting material to develop advanced therapies, then yeah. this unit may be not require such kind of test and will be the uh, responsibility of the uh, of the ATMP manufacturer what they require for the static material because what is important then is the qualification of the final product because if you are developing IPS from corbulot the characteristics of this corbulot may not be necessary to have this kind of C34 measurements or whatever. But for that, the most important is the informed concept that the mother has signed at that time. So I think to this very, I think from our side is the units don't become old. First, second, we need to define very well what we are talking about. Bone marrow transplantation or starting material for advanced therapies. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other comments about um, the problems that do they present old corporate units? Well, I mean, I, this oh, is, oh, sorry. This is Louise Holander. Um, I am with Clinimmune Labs, and we see the public core banks for Colorado and St. Louis. Um, so we have a, a fairly large inventory, and, and our problem is becoming um, our older core buds are are not wanting to be used. So the question becomes, how long do we store for? We have inventory dating back to 1996. Um, and 
With those older units, some of them are still in cryovials and people find that out and don't want them. Uh, they are constantly asking us, can we run the new NAT updated testing? And the truth is that there are no validated kits and core labs for that. So that leaves that out. So the problem becomes, do we keep these older units in storage, which is cheap, but we are replacing with newer units? And um, are these units valuable for anything? Um, we've been mentioning research, but our research um, partners want fresh units, not frozen. So do we do HLA typing, uh, update our HLA typing on those and keep the ones that are unique? Do we get rid of the ones that aren't? Do we get rid of our smaller units once our HRSA contracts expire and we no longer need to keep all of those? This is becoming a storage question for some of the large cord banks. What is valuable to us and what is not valuable to anyone? Thank you. That's an excellent perspective. Thank you. This is Bruce Weinberg. I'm, rep I'm representing the National Cord Blood Program at New York Blood Center. And similar to what Louise just described, we have similar issues. Over the course of the years, we've used different methods for cryopreservation and our products became licensed approximately, I think it was about 10 years ago. So we have licensed and unlicensed products. And some of the transplant centers want only licensed products. Others want uh, anything that matches correctly or is big enough. <clears throat> and so we have had to in institute in our or implement in our um, stability program where we actually do stability testing on uh, samples every year from products that were processed in a variety of different methods in our bank over the course of time in order to be able to say that the ones that were uh, processed 20 years ago by one method are equivalent and as viable as the ones that were processed more recently according to the um, licensure standards that we've achieved. Now in a cord blood, in a, uh, a public bank, that's not easy, but it can be done because you can decide to sacrifice certain uh, units or certain test vials or certain segments. But in a private bank, that's not so easy to do as has already been pointed out uh, because you don't necessarily have samples that you can, um, that you can destroy in a sense, um, from private clients. Yeah, I have a comment about this. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, we, we are from private corporate bank here, and we uh, not very frequently, from time to time, we receive requests from uh, previously registered families, and they would like to uh, discontinue uh, banking the core blood for their kids which have been banked say 15 years ago or 14 years ago, uh, they decide to reject the unit to ask us to discard them. We give them the option either or, uh, they have the option to donate for the cold blood bank, the private cold blood bank, or to uh, discard. Of course, we respect their um, decision. So if they choose, and I would say here, majority of them, they have chosen to, to donate it for uh, quality assurance purposes, for uh, for progenics, for our organization, just for uh, uh, R&D and for uh, validation studies, quality assurance studies, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we are able to use those core blood units and to incorporate them in, in the stability program and to analyze them for viabilities and for potencies and uh, yeah, we, so we do have some units. It's not like we have to discard them all. And I can tell you from experience, I would say the majority of them are being donated these days rather than asking us to discard them. Uh, people awareness about corporate banking and the potential studies and the research in this uh, arena uh, have encouraged people to have the cellular therapy communities to do more research in the stem cell uh, field. This is Jeff uh, Wilson from MD Anderson Cord Blood Bank. Um, we're a public bank. And, um, you know, I think 
you know, we're talking about the age of units and obviously there's a number of different things that make it an old unit and that may be bake specific, whether it's processing technique, age of the bank, size of the unit. Um, but really the question is, why are we talking about this? And it's my understanding that, you know, now we have transplant centers that are looking at units and they're worried, hey, this thing's been in the freezer for 10 or more years. Um, should we use it or not? And, and so, and we're all on this call saying, hey, we've got stability programs in place. They meet specific criteria. We're able to show that they're good for 10, 20 plus years. Um, I think that really what has to happen is we have, as an industry, have to kind of come up with a way to uh, aspire confidence in the transplant centers that these units that are banked long term are still as viable as something that's being put in the freezer today. Yep. And there are, you know, and that may be actually just based around the quality program under which it was banked or what data is about available, whether it be viability, CD34, HLA, etc. Right. Um, but I think that that's really the question is like, okay, we're having a discussion about what's an old unit, but why, you know, it's because yeah. we want people to continue to be able to use them. We think they're still good and Absolutely. We convince people of that. Yeah, I have answer for that. Um, it's a very valid point. I like it. Uh, and thank you for asking this question. Um, in some other public banks, they may not have been following uh, the uh, accreditation standards and they don't have guidance. As you know, we are in the CBA. Uh, uh, the CBA encompass corporate banks that are accredited by either ABB or FAC. And in their home countries, they may not have regulatory requirements to follow. And they do have a corporate bank operating there. It's kind of educational for the public corporate bank and the private corporate banks in those countries where they don't have a guidance what to do with the public uh, units that have been or the private units that they have been banked long time ago we're not talking uh, only about uh, the experts that we have in our meeting today um, majority of you like are uh, very well uh, uh, knowledgeable about the regulatory requirement depends on uh, the country where you're located in. and the government, um, for instance, in, the, in Health Canada, like in the Canadian market, uh, the, uh, under the cells and tissues organs, um, it's uh, it's also regulated, but also with the AABB and the fact accreditation, it has more educational um, support and guidance how public corporate banks and private corporate banks can proceed about these old units, and this is this is perfect uh, perspective that you mentioned, Jeff. Um, again, this is not only for us here; this is for the general public in many different countries uh, to learn and to see what we consider as a uh, old corporate unit. Uh, not necessarily, uh, we all know, like if it was sky preserved properly and. Uh, processed properly and uh, we do have a stability program to prove that it's still alive and viable and the potency and the purity everything we know it's going to be effective like uh, from from the corporate bank perspective not from the patient side at right. least and from our side so <clears throat> So, so the question is, is there a way that we can, or working with registries or whatnot, show that, okay, these cords meet this level of, you know, like, again, whether you're FACT accredited or AAB accredited, you know, FDA licensed, you have a level of, of quality that you put into the system. Um, you know, ideally, it would be nice to, for that to translate into something that as a, you know, someone's doing a search on, you know, whether NMDP or WMDA or whatnot, you can see it's an accredited bank of, of some level. And therefore you might have a, a larger uh, sense of uh, what you security, I guess, in selecting a cord from the one place versus the other. So, so Jeff, so, Jeff kind of just to no, jump in, it, it sounds like, uh, you know, there's the perception versus uh, 
you know, reality or actually science-based, uh, yeah. you know, so you've got like previous old units that were processed, plasma reduced, uh, you know, there's evidence of adverse events, uh, high risk of that uh, versus just, you know, it's an older unit, so it must not be as good or, you know, a newer unit that was put in the freezer a year ago uh, is, is going to be better. And, and kind of change, changing the perception from the transplant centers that's that's kind of driving that. Um, the other thing I wanted to add was for us, uh, you know, segment testing is one of those things that has been incredibly frustrating um, because it was one of those things where, uh, you know, you're processing, it's a standard that came after the fact. Um, and we, we've actually kind of trained the transplant centers to expect it. So at this point now, even though you've got stability studies that show that these units are fine um, or should be, right? Uh, fair confidence that, that the units are, are okay to use. Um, if you don't have that segment testing, there's a high likelihood that those units aren't gonna be requested or that they're gonna go for a different unit. Um, and so, so those are some of the challenges. I've, I, I've seen and yeah, anyways. So, <laughs> I'd like to say something else about our stability testing. Don't ever forget that stability testing is only looking at surrogates, okay? CD34 is a measure and viability is a measure that we use, but there are a lot of cells that are CD34 positive. They're not all stem cells. When you do colony assays, you're assaying progenitor cells, and they're not the cells that are responsible for long-term durable engraftment. All of this is surrogate assays. And we have had situations, I am responsible also for the cell therapy lab that handles apheresis products from adult donors. And uh, we have had situations in that laboratory where we have thawed vials, cryovials, to look at viability prior to a transplant, and the viability in the vial is, is not good. And then when they actually do the, the transplant, because they have no choice but to use that product, and they do viability on the actual bag, what's left in the bag at the end of the infusion, the viability is fine and the patient does fine. And so we like to incorporate as much as possible engraftment into our, bio, into our um, uh, stability uh, parameters. You can't do it for everything in a cord blood, obviously, in a cord blood bank, obviously. But when we do stability for um, apheresis products or bone marrow products, we always look at the vials from products that have been infused so that we can also compare the results with what has engrafted. And it's actually, the stability tests may not be all that valuable because you often see engraftment that's exactly within the parameters that you anticipate that have been stable over years and years and years. Um, and the vial that we tested wasn't great. Um, you know, even flow cytometry, when you do it, it depends how quickly you, you get it onto the, the flow cytometer, how long the exposure has been to the DMSO in the product prior to the staining, prior to the running of the sample. All of these things affect the viability in both your segments and your vials. And so we have to be very, very careful when we say that you can exactly translate what we see in our, in our stability studies to what the actual situation is in the product. Perfect. Thank you very much for this perspective. Absolutely. So, the behavior so this, in vivo might be different than that in vitro, right? So this is, something, this is something that is uh, really important to look, uh, to look into it. And especially, uh, we have many evidence uh, after engraftment when doing uh, the testing for chimerisms, right? And we see the results and we see um, like which cells, which does are being more prominent than the others, uh, et cetera. So this is a great point. Thank you so much for bringing it up. Definitely the behavior of the cells 
in vivo, uh, in vitro may uh, differ um, from that behavior in the in vivo. And again, for the sake of the time, we're approaching uh, the, the first hour, uh, ten, we still have to, uh, 10 minutes. Um, uh, how might uh, they be managed, those old core blood units? If we can get some ideas about how might they be managed? So since we heard about many, many different things, um, is there any idea how can we manage them in a way to use them or maybe not to use them for transplant? Is there any other use for them other than transplantation if we don't want to give them for like two patients, for instance? Other than, um, of course, um, we have many ideas such as the or retrospective validation for all methods and the processing technique and the cryoprotectant used um, back then. There, there are plenty of uh, uh, variable parameters in every cold blood bank. It's that there is no way to capture everything, but it would be nice to hear about your opinion about it. How can you manage those cold blood units? No, I, I, I insist on what I say. I think the, be, the best solution for them, in addition to research, uh, is, is to, 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 that they become a starting material for, for developing medicine. But for that, what we need to, to agree and to develop our procedures, good clinical practice procedure for reconsenting and repurposing the original donation. And this is the more critical issue. The ethics of a donation that was primarily done for transplantation, and now we want to use for other applications. We have experience in Barcelona, for instance, to repurpose donations of units that are homozygous for HLA for, for, uh, to do an bank of IPSCs. So we managed to convince our ethic regulator to re recontact mothers, to reconsent mothers, and those that has accepted to repurpose these units has transferred to a particular application. So in the future, you can use these units for many things, for instance, for immunotherapy, uh, for, for, for CAR T cell development, for, for direct immunotherapy, uh, in, in, for instance, in, in generating virus specific T cells, et cetera. So I, I, this is the, 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 the main application we foresee. Right. So any other idea about how might they be managed? Uh, do we like to consider, for example, separating them from uh, other inventory that we have in our uh, liquid nitrogen tanks or whatever the medium that you're putting your stem cells in? I mean, I think that it, it would have to be based on the ability of the unit to meet your current quality release standards or your current yes. quality system. Yes. I mean, if you can do that, age is, is just a number, right? <laughs> so, Of course, of course. Yeah. And maybe I'll just offer a different perspective, like from the reg, because I also work on the registry side every unit has a cord blood unit report. So the transplant centers are seeing all the information about a cord blood unit, TNC, CD34, the method it was processed. So I don't know if the apprehension from transplant centers is coming because it's an old unit or because the units are not meeting all the quality standards of what they're looking for in a unit. We're a relatively um, new bank, I guess, like less than 10 years old. So most of our units have been processed the same way and we don't face some of these challenges. But maybe a suggestion for some of those older units too, it probably is worthwhile, especially for the public banks to look at your inventory and to understand the redundance that you might have in your inventory. Yes. If you have like, so we've done an analysis of our HLA haplotype frequency. And so we actually know how many units we have of the same haplotype. So for those smaller units, you can then disposition them differently. But for the larger units, then you might want to put in some extra effort to get them typed to a certain HLA resolution, to put more effort into testing and typing them. So I think every bank also has to look at their inventory and then you can probably do a little bit of um, segregation out into what are the ones that are worth putting a little bit more effort to 
add some testing qualities too. So that's just a suggestion. Excellent suggestion. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Heidi. And if I can uh, jump back in, so that again, the family bank perspective is also be a little different, but I think the end goal here is again, the product in general for either a public or a family type bank, what's the usability? I think that's the real question at the end of the day. It's, it's age, does it affect usability and what will the use be? Originally it was for transplants. Now there's clinical trials. Um, we had you know, some just brief discussions here about uh, generating immune cells or other sort of therapies. There are units that would never have gone up for a transplant, but have used in cellular therapy for regenerative medicine in, in clinical trials from our own inventory by our clients. Their metrics would never meet transplant, but they met other things. So again, we don't know the full usability will happen in 10 or 20 years. And I think that for at least um, our clients at a family bank, that's the most important thing to them. What kind of uses maybe there be? What kind of guarantees, as we discussed, can we do or can't we do? Um, and again, societies like the CBA I can help educate, I think, everyone on what the potential usabilities or lack of usabilities or potentials are out there from clinical trials, science and research. I think that's the real valuable thing across the board. And some of these things may switch you know, from transplant to testing to uh, other materials, that's a huge debate right now across the board. So it's good to have this. Right, right. Another thing I may bring to the table um, for the old units, if we label them old units, some elements may not have been matching with the current regulatory and accreditation requirement for transmissible disease markers, for instance. Uh, there are, as we all know, in the past, not we didn't have a very comprehensive uh, TD markers like uh, transmissible disease testing uh, for specific markers. I would say 20, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, as much as we do have now. I give an example: the West Nile virus, for instance, is required in some countries, not required in other countries as well, and also. Um, the sterility testing, uh, were we um, testing for aerobic bacteria in addition to the, sorry, the anaerobic bacteria in addition to the aerobic bacteria, which is the most popular one to detect, and the fungi, uh, was, uh, there are many questions maybe we should ask ourselves, are those old cord blood units were uh, fully satisfactory in meeting the current standard in terms of the testing requirement also, uh, if we bring to the table the sterility requirement to test aerobic, anaerobic, and fungi versus the transmissible disease testing, et cetera, et cetera, would, taking into consideration the changes in regulatory requirement, not only in the accreditation requirement, which is something that we must follow, definitely. Uh, if anybody has any idea about it, would like to comment. We're very close to 12 o'clock. I fully respect your time, everyone. And would like to thank you all. But if anybody would like to have last moment thought to speak about, please feel free. We still have a couple minutes. And more than happy to, uh, to hear your opinion. And we'll be happy to uh, listen to you. Yes, so my name is Gocha Shatir Shule. I represent uh, Corbot Bank Geocord from Tbilisi, Georgia. Uh, we are all talking about uh, new days, but in future, we don't we should not forget about future technologies. Maybe today or maybe uh, tomorrow, the viability is not so high, but we can revive the cells after 10, 20 years when new technologies will appear and uh, this technology will allow us to expand cells, expand not only hematopoietic stem cells, but also T-Rex, uh, dendritic cells, CAR T cells, CAR uh, NC cells, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We uh, on monocyte expansion. We can use uh, cord blood also for tissue engineering in 20, in 10, in 30 years. We should think uh, on future. Uh, and not yes. only today. And because of this, for us, for family banks, it's very important to think in this uh, direction because we promise our clients to store for whole life, for uh, decades or for 100 years, yes? 
and because of we should uh, think about this and technologies new technologies which will appear will help us to hold our promises and uh, to keep our promises and i think this is important nobody knows today what happens after 50 years but cord blood cells stem cells are the best materials what we can uh, find in humans yes and we no. should not discard this we should uh, store it keep it and to uh, think about future and not about today's and uh, I think that this is a very important issue. Yeah, I can't agree more with you, especially with the advances in science now and the cellular expansion. Uh, we don't know where it's going to take us in the next few days, a few years. I hope it's a few days. <laughs> so uh, we don't know. Even for uh, low volume, sometimes we receive. And according to current uh, acceptance criteria, we reject them, right? And who knows, maybe a little bit of cord blood can, be, can become a very, very, very interesting therapeutic dose for potential patient, right? So when the new technology kicks in for cellular expansion and uh, various things, so it's, it's good, especially with the value of the cord blood transplantation and the permissible transplant um, having four to five out of six genes matching which is uh, something uh, very differentiating factor compared to the adults themselves. And uh, yeah, the future, um, we don't know what the future is holding. And I really enjoyed this discussion. And in their home countries, they may not have regulatory requirements to follow. And they do have a corporate bank operating there. It's kind of educational for the public corporate bank and the private corporate banks in those countries where they don't have a guidance what to do with the public uh, units that have been, or the private units that they have been banked long time ago. We're not talking uh, only about uh, the experts that we have in our meeting today. Um, majority of you like are uh, very well uh, uh, knowledgeable about the regulatory requirement depends on uh, the country where you're located in. and the government um, for instance in, the, in health canada like in the canadian market uh, the, uh, under the cells and tissues organs um, it's uh, it's also regulated but also with the aabb and the fact accreditation it has more educational um, support and guidance how public corporate banks and private corporate banks can proceed about these old units. And this is this is perfect uh, perspective that you mentioned, Jeff. Um, again, this is not only for us here, this is for the general public in many different countries uh, to learn and to see what we consider as a uh, old corporate unit, uh, not necessarily uh, we all know like if it was sky preserved properly and uh, processed properly and uh, we do have a stability program to prove that it's still alive and viable and the potency and the purity everything we know it's going to be effective like uh, from from the corporate bank perspective not from the patient side at right. least from our side so <clears throat> So, so the question is, is there a way that we can, or working with registries or whatnot, show that, okay, these cords meet this level of, you know, like, again, whether you're fact accredited or AAB accredited, you know, FDA licensed, you have a level of, of quality that you put into the system. Um, you know, ideally, it would be nice to, for that to translate into something that as a, you know, someone's doing a search on, you know, whether NMDP or WMDA or whatnot, you can see it's an accredited bank of, of some level. And therefore you might have a, a larger uh, sense of uh, what you security, I guess, in selecting a cord from the one place versus the other. So, so Jeff, so, Jeff kind of just to no, jump in, it, it sounds like, uh, you know, there's the perception versus uh, 
you know, reality or actually science-based, uh, yeah. you know, so you've got like previous old units that were processed, plasma reduced, uh, you know, there's evidence of adverse events, uh, high risk of that uh, versus just, you know, it's an older unit, so it must not be as good or, you know, a newer unit that was put in the freezer a year ago uh, is, is going to be better. And, and kind of change, changing the perception from the transplant centers that's that's kind of driving that. Um, the other thing I wanted to add was for us, uh, you know, segment testing is one of those things that has been incredibly frustrating um, because it was one of those things where, uh, you know, you're processing, it's a standard that came after the fact. Um, and we, we've actually kind of trained the transplant centers to expect it. So at this point now, even though you've got stability studies that show that these units are fine um, or should be, right? Uh, fair confidence that, that the units are, are okay to use. Um, if you don't have that segment testing, there's a high likelihood that those units aren't gonna be requested or that they're gonna go for a different unit. Um, and so, so those are some of the challenges. I've, I, I've seen and yeah, anyways. So, <laughs> I'd like to say something else about our stability testing. Don't ever forget that stability testing is only looking at surrogates, okay? CD34 is a measure and viability is a measure that we use, but there are a lot of cells that are CD34 positive. They're not all stem cells. When you do colony assays, you're assaying progenitor cells, and they're not the cells that are responsible for long-term durable engraftment. All of this is surrogate assays. And we have had situations, I am responsible also for the cell therapy lab that handles apheresis products from adult donors. And uh, we have had situations in that laboratory where we have thawed vials, cryovials, to look at viability prior to a transplant, and the viability in the vial is, is not good. And then when they actually do the, the transplant, because they have no choice but to use that product, and they do viability on the actual bag, what's left in the bag at the end of the infusion, the viability is fine and the patient does fine. And so we like to incorporate as much as possible engraftment into our, bio, into our um, uh, stability uh, parameters. You can't do it for everything in a cord blood, obviously, in a cord blood bank, obviously. But when we do stability for um, apheresis products or bone marrow products, we always look at the vials from products that have been infused so that we can also compare the results with what has engrafted. And it's actually, the stability tests may not be all that valuable because you often see engraftment that's exactly within the parameters that you anticipate that have been stable over years and years and years. Um, and the vial that we tested wasn't great. Um, you know, even flow cytometry, when you do it, it depends how quickly you, you get it onto the, the flow cytometer, how long the exposure has been to the DMSO in the product prior to the staining, prior to the running of the sample. All of these things affect the viability in both your segments and your vials. And so we have to be very, very careful when we say that you can exactly translate what we see in our, in our stability studies to what the actual situation is in the product. Perfect. Thank you very much for this perspective. Absolutely. So, the behavior so this, in vivo might be different than that in vitro, right? So this is, something, this is something that is uh, really important to look, uh, to look into it. And especially, uh, we have many evidence uh, after engraftment when doing uh, the testing for chimerisms, right? And we see the results and we see um, like which cells, which does are being more prominent than the others, uh, et cetera. So this is a great point. Thank you so much for bringing it up. Definitely the behavior of the cells 
in vivo, uh, in vitro may uh, differ um, from that behavior in the in vivo. And again, for the sake of the time, we're approaching uh, the, the first hour. Uh, ten, we still have to, uh, 10 minutes. Um, uh, how might uh, they be managed, those old core blood units? If we can get some ideas about how might they be managed? So since we heard about many, many different things, um, is there any idea how can we manage them in a way to use them or maybe not to use them for transplant? Is there any other use for them other than transplantation if we don't want to give them for like two patients, for instance? Other than, um, of course, um, we have many ideas such as the or retrospective validation for all methods and the processing technique and the cryoprotectant used um, back then. There, there are plenty of uh, uh, variable parameters in every cold blood bank. It's that there is no way to capture everything, but it would be nice to hear about your opinion about it. How can you manage those cold blood units? Either like if they are suitable for transplant or not suitable for transplant, specifically for those we identified them earlier as old core blood units, as per the definition provided by every one of uh, our experts on this call today. So we put on the table the problem now we're trying to find a solution. And what will be the recommendation from our team today, uh, from our discussion? How can, like the take home message, what can we say we can do with those old core blood units? What's the potential use for them? It could be quality assurance, could be uh, retrospective validation for certain procedures, uh, maybe so find Yeah. Please go ahead. What is the definition for old? Is it 10 years, 20 years? What, what is the definition of old? Maybe when the regulation changed between vials to bags, that was a turn, turn point, you know, changing the game. Because if today we cannot test, there's no segment to test the old units that been right. preserved in vials. So right. over there, we have a huge problem. Maybe researchers, maybe cell and gene therapy, maybe CAR T, all of the allergenic maybe treatment can be used by those old units. That's an excellent point. Anybody else has another point? No, I, I, I insist in what I say. I think the, be, the best solution for them, in addition to research, uh, is, is to, 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 that they become a starting material for, for developing medicines. But for that, what we need to, to agree and to develop our procedures, good clinical practice procedure for reconsenting and repurposing the original donation. And this is the more critical issue. The ethics of a donation that was primarily done for transplantation and now we want to use for other applications. We have experience in Barcelona, for instance, to repurpose donations of units that are homozygous for HLA for, for, uh, to do an APRO bank of IPSCs. So we managed to convince our ethic regulator to re recontact mothers, to reconsent mothers, and those that has accepted to repurpose these units has been transferred to a particular application. So in the future, you can use these units for many things, for instance, for immunotherapy. Uh, for 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 CAR T cell development, for for direct immunotherapy, uh, in in for instance in, in generating virus specific T cells, uh, etc. So I, I, this is the the, the the main application we foresee. Right. So any other idea about how might they be managed? Uh, do we like to consider? For example, separating them from uh, other inventory that we have in our uh, liquid nitrogen tanks or whatever the 
medium that you're putting your stem cells in? I mean, I think that it, it would have to be based on the ability of the unit to meet your current quality release standards or your current yes. quality system. Yes. I mean, if you can do that, age is, is just a number, right? <laughs> so, of course, of course. Yeah. And maybe I'll just offer a different perspective, like from the reg, because I also work on the registry side. Every unit has a cord blood unit report. So the transplant centers are seeing all the information about a cord blood unit, TNC, CD34, the method it was processed. So I don't know if the apprehension from transplant centers is coming because it's an old unit or because the units are not meeting all the quality standards of what they're looking for in a unit. We're a relatively um, new bank, I guess, like less than 10 years old. So most of our units have been processed the same way and we don't face some of these challenges. But maybe a suggestion for some of those older units too, it probably is worthwhile, especially for the public banks to look at your inventory and to understand the redundance that you might have in your inventory. Yes. If you have like, so we've done an analysis of our HLA haplotype frequency. And so we actually know how many units we have of the same haplotype. So for those smaller units, you can then disposition them differently. But for the larger units, then you might want to put in some extra effort to get them typed to a certain HLA resolution, to put more effort into testing and typing them. So I think every bank also has to look at their inventory and then you can probably do a little bit of um, segregation out into what are the ones that are worth putting a little bit more effort to add some testing qualities to. So that's just a suggestion. Excellent suggestion. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Heidi. And if I can uh, jump back into so the, again, the family bank perspective is also going to be a little different, but I think the end goal here is again, the product in general for either a public or a, a family type bank, what's the usability? I think that's the real question at the end of the day. It's, it's age, does it affect usability and what will the use be? Originally it was for transplants. Now there's clinical trials. Um, we had you know some just brief discussions here about uh, generating immune cells or other sort of therapies. There are units that would never have gone up for a transplant, but have used in cellular therapy for regenerative medicine in, in clinical trials from our own inventory by our clients. Their metrics would never meet transplant, but they met other things. So again, we don't know the full usability what will happen in 10 or 20 years. And I think that for at least um, our clients at a family bank, that's the most important thing to them. What kind of uses maybe there be? What kind of guarantees, as we discussed, can we do or can't we do? Um, and again, societies like the CBA I can help educate, I think, everyone on what the potential usabilities or lack of usabilities or potentials are out there from clinical trials, science and research. I think that's the real valuable thing across the board. And some mm -hmm. of these things may switch. You know, from transplant to testing to uh, other materials, that's a huge debate right now across the board. So it's good to have this. Right, right. Another thing I may bring to the table um, for the old units, if we label them old units, some elements may not have been matching with the current regulatory and accreditation requirement for transmissible disease markers, for instance. Uh, there are, as we all know, in the past, not, we didn't have a very comprehensive uh, TD markers, like uh, transmissive disease testing uh, for specific markers, I would say 20, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, as much as we do have now. I give an example, the West Nile virus, for instance, is required in some countries, not required in other countries as well. And also um, the sterility testing, uh, were we um, testing for aerobic bacteria in addition to the, sorry, the anaerobic bacteria in addition to the aerobic bacteria, which is the most popular one to detect and the fungi uh, was, uh, there are many questions maybe we should ask ourselves. Are those old cord blood units were uh, fully satisfactory in meeting the current standard in terms of the testing requirement also, uh, if we bring to the table the sterility requirement to test aerobic, anaerobic, and fungi versus the transmissible disease testing, et cetera, et cetera, with taking into consideration the changes in regulatory requirement, not only in the accreditation requirement, which is something that we must follow, definitely. Uh, if anybody has any idea about it, would like to comment, 
we're very close to 12 o'clock. I fully respect your time, everyone. And I would like to thank you all. But if anybody would like to have last moment thought to speak about, please feel free. We still have a couple minutes. And more than happy to, uh, to hear your opinion, Lewis and I. And we'll be happy to uh, listen to you. Yes, so my name is Gocha Shatirishwile. I represent uh, Corbot Bank Geocord from Tbilisi, Georgia. Uh, we are all talking about uh, new days, but in future, we don't we should not forget about future technologies. Maybe today or maybe uh, tomorrow, the viability is not so high, but we can revive the cells after 10, 20 years when new technologies will appear and uh, this technology will allow us to expand cells, expand not only hematopoietic stem cells, but also T-Rex, uh, dendritic cells, CAR T cells, CAR NC cells, etc., etc. We uh, on monocyte expansion. We can use uh, cord blood also for tissue engineering in 20, in 10, in 30 years. We should think uh, on future. Uh, and not yes. only today. And because of this, for us, for family banks, it's very important to think in this uh, direction because we promise our clients to store for whole life, for uh, decades or for 100 years, yes? And because of we should uh, think about this and technologies, new technologies which will appear will help us to hold our promises and to, to keep our promises. And I think this is important. Nobody knows today what happens after 50 years, but cord blood cells, stem cells are the best materials what we can uh, find in humans, yes? And we no. should not discard this. We should uh, store it, keep it, and to uh, think about future and not about today's. And, uh, I think that this is a very important issue. Yeah, I can't agree more with you, especially with the advances in science now and the cellular expansion. Uh, we don't know where it's going to take us in the next few days, a few years. I hope it's a few days. <laughs> so uh, we don't know. Even for uh, low volume, sometimes we receive. And according to current uh, acceptance criteria, we reject them, right? And who knows, maybe a little bit of cord blood can, be, can become a very, very, very interesting therapeutic dose for potential patient, right? So when the new technology kicks in for cellular expansion and uh, various things. So it's, it's good, especially with the value of the cord blood transplantation and the permissible transplant um, having four to five out of six genes matching which is uh, something uh, very differentiating factor compared to the adults themselves. And uh, yeah, the future, um, we don't know what the future is holding, but we learn a lot from every one of you. Thank you for your time.